All righty, and welcome back to the Cultsology Podcast. My name is Parker, and in today's video, uh, I want to dive into Stephen Holder's recent conversation he had in Arizona with Colts owner Jim Ursay. Um, obviously, down there for the team owners meeting, uh, seems like they were able to have some good discussions. Saw a lot of the Colts reporters reporting on um, some different keynotes or different points in the conversation they had speaking with Mr. Ursay. Um, and one of them, obviously, in today's video, we're going to cover Stevens. Uh, so let's dive into it here. Um, just wrapped up a late night chat with Colts owner Jim Ursay. The takeaways. Uh, first off, first thing they wanted to get into is uh, regarding Lamar Jackson. He was empathetic. The money is not the problem, but instead took issue with the draft capital slash compensation. Didn't speak to fully guaranteed deal to be clear. So we don't need to speculate on that or worry. Um, one of the notes I took down here. Um, is thank you, Jim, for clearing up the potential, you know, argument. You've seen some people say, do the Colts have enough money to potentially put into an escrow account uh, to be able to, you know, have money set aside for something like that? I think that as a Colts fan and as a, you know, resident of Indianapolis, knowing, you know, money's not going to be the issue. He clears that up first, um, you know, knowing there's a strong financial position uh, on your team and that's attractive for potential free agents to know, like, that's not a that's not a worry to have here in Indianapolis. Um, all right, uh, fair point. I put down here. Let's see something else. Fair point, Mister Ursay saying. Uh, fair point, Mister Ursay uh, saying. In between the lines, we aren't the Panthers, Broncos, Raiders, and Commanders. Um, when he's talking about the uh, money is not the problem, obviously, but he's talking about draft capital slash compensation. So. He's basically saying we're not those teams. Obviously, we recently saw the Panthers trade uh, the farm and the neighbor's farm to be able to move up, uh, what was it, eight spots from nine to one, um, obviously giving up a big asset in DJ Moore. But if they believe they're going to be able to start fresh with this first pick in the, the draft, again, he's saying we're not one of those teams. We're just going to get fleeced. Uh, Broncos, we saw obviously with the Russ Wilson trade, the Raiders, and there's several examples there, Raiders as well. Um, what I wrote down here is we're not just going to get patted down like that, right? You're not just going to fleece the Indianapolis Colts like that. Mr. Ursay speaking to that firsthand. He's not going to let anything like that happen. It'll be a strong and fast uh, veto when it comes to, you know, big decisions, hopefully like that. Do I think he gets that intervened in the day-to-day -day operations? No, but um, again, I think through if you're, getting, you're paying attention, it seems like there is a strong bond and bull between uh, Mr. Ursay and Chris Ballard, and that's maybe why his job's not as much on the hot seat as it should be. But again, something relevant will continue here in the future. In the words of Ravens GM, when discussing his Lamar contract, it takes two to tango. Um, so Lamar, if you're serious about getting out of town, which we obviously saw by his tweets yesterday, um, it takes two to tango. That was kind of my big takeaway from this first bulletin point here um, when discussing Lamar Jackson, right? Like, I think the Indianapolis Colts would be stupid, obviously, not to entertain that. But again, it does take two to tango. And when listening to the Ravens GM discuss that, I thought it was a clear and obvious comment that was uh, something the Colts should obviously keep in mind. And Mr. Ursi, I think, is kind of expressing that here in his point. Um, you know, we're not going to get, you know, give up all this draft capital for future years and be handcuffed as far as compensation. That's just a smart business move. I couldn't. Um, give any flack or any pressure there obviously it's going to have to be a little bit more um, give on Lamar's side and you know making it obvious like we discussed with Aaron Rodgers saying this is a team I want to go for clearly all if you're following that side of the news of the NFL it's just between those team and who's gonna who's got the 51 versus 49 percent leverage and is going to be able to pull the other side over um, let's get into point number two here he reportedly or he repeatedly said there a big lesson that they've learned in roster building is that there are no shortcuts, i.e. Carson Wentz and Matt Ryan discussing the past two years. Interesting point. I said it means not loading up Madden, selecting the oldest quarterback with the highest salary that's available on the market. So I saw that meme on Colts Twitter and I thought it was funny and I thought I would kind of bring it up here, right? Like basically no band-aids right as my dad says he says we got to stop we have to stop shopping at garage sales for quarterbacks right you got to stop getting everybody's seconds thirds whatever again to shut down that argument before it happens Lamar wanting out is not the same as a garage show those other players uh, at least in Phillip Rivers he was available on the market obviously Carson wins and Matt Ryan we had to trade for but those teams made it very clear we don't want to we don't want you anymore it's not vice versa um, meaning the player didn't want to be there anymore it was more the team we don't want you anymore um, it's not a good strategy is obviously band-aid solutions at quarterback um, getting serious about 
um, a long-term solution. And again, you're at that weird crossroads where it's like, hey, we have the number four pick. We got it for a reason because this team was that terrible this past year at 4-12-1. and one. But also at the crossroads of, you know, something that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Mr. Ursay, let's talk about this for just a quick second because I think it's highly interesting. The past two times that Mr. Ursay um, and this Colts organization have had to draft a quarterback at number one overall, they have just so lucky been able to pull that slot machine and get the lottery ticket that is, you know, generational talent and Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck, right? And he's pulled this once-in-a-lifetime weird crossroads of, hey, you know, as many of you think, and I can obviously see that point of getting a younger, what you think potentially has a higher upside in Anthony Richardson. I'm not ignorant to understanding that argument and seeing that vision. Okay. It's part of the cool things about being a supporter on this channel. Hopefully you think outside the box. Right. Um, but again, seeing that weird once in a lifetime, because I think most people would argue, what, when do you get players at age 26 available, you know, former MVPs and they're the ones coming out saying, I don't want to play with you anymore. You see that in the NBA, right? And that's where you kind of have seen, again, how many examples can we point to where it seems like that player empowerment we're seeing over in the NBA is starting to bleed its way into the NFL. Again, it's a weird crossroads where it's like, hey, clearly and obviously it says take the take the quarterback and the draft and so on and so forth. But it's that once in a, you know, well, I don't want to say lifetime because I don't genuinely believe it's going to be a once in a lifetime scenario. I think it's going to be something we continue to see. But this first time in you know, maybe the history of the league where we've seen a player of this, you know, athletic ability at the quarterback position become available, you'd be stupid not to entertain it, right? Or at least do, as we say in the business world or on, you know, when you follow GM chat, do your due diligence, right? You owe it to the organization, you owe it to the fan base, you owe it to your supporters. Point number three, key note, one thing, one of the key things to roster building is patience, Fair point and touche, Mr. Ursay. Our comeback, as I feel like representing part of the fan base, representing again the people who spend money on this product and that product that you continue to endorse, is we got to get back to winning quick, fast, in a hurry. Because how many years in a row can you continue to sell slow starts, not winning in week one, not beating our division rival in Tennessee, not being able to pull out a win? We get the best we could do was a tie versus the Texans, right? You're going to sell me that one win versus Jacksonville, but then I'm going to sell you. We haven't beat them at Jacksonville since 2014. What about all your fans down in Florida? Can't go down to a local Jacksonville game early in the year and enjoy it. Why? Because they know they're going to walk out of there with an embarrassing loss. And here's my point for number three. I said in January of 2022, Mr. Say was all chips in. One, four, 12 in one season. And that theory is a light year away. Good to know. Good to know. Number three, rule out any last hope of a D hop or Denver trade. Um, those dreams just shank, sank down to 0%. I be, that basically saying he's not going to microwave it. He's not going to give the Denver Broncos or D hop and them, you know, whatever it takes, especially the initial cap it's going to take to to sign him this year. He, he's basically saying those, those dreams are no. Um, they're trying to win in 23, but not just at any cost. That's a fair point. I mean, obviously, we want to win, but we don't want to microwave it because I don't think that's a, a an i an ideological thought process in the current day AFC. Um, number four, he did say we're not closing the door on any avenue of improvement, and that includes signing a player like Lamar Jackson. But it seems like the draft is the focus. My point here was um, whether this is a truth or a lie. We'll find out in about 30 to 33 days when the draft comes and it goes. Um, number five here. Sounds like the trajectory of the team is how Chris, our GM Chris Ballard will be judged this season. Sounds like the trajectory of the team is how GM Chris Ballard will be judged this season. Ballard is obviously, our Ballard is not on some quick hot seat. Obviously you expect him to say it. What is he going to say the opposite? He's on the hottest seat in the league. Why would he say that? He's obviously saying, hey, he's not on some quick hot seat, but letting us know it could get hot. <laughs> but the expectations are there, obviously, to succeed. And everyone knows when you're going uh, in the right direction, you can tell. Thank you, Mr. Ursay. I will say that's a point I've been trying to make here on the channel with my friends and family, right? Um, using what we've experienced as a Colts fan base and as an organization to our advantage is not something we should be punished for. We've seen generational talent. We've seen great football for so many years in a row. 
We know what not good looks like. We know what subpar looks like. When you, Mr. Ursay, and hopefully Chris Ballard realize trying to sell these fans, you know, something that's not it, we're going to be able to tell quick, fast, in a hurry, right? Which just sets the bar that much higher. That's part of our jobs as being fans. It's a guilty luxury we have. And the Patriots fans are in that same boat. Steelers fans probably in that same boat. You know, they feel entitled to some degree because they've seen the bar so high. They know when it is or isn't it, right? They know a good product when they see it. Mr. Ursay saying it right there. It's going to be real obvious if it's it or not. And if it's not, we'll be able to tell. So my point there was this trajectory of the team is how we will be judged this season. If I could get that on like a tweet and then blow it up behind me where the Colts flag is. And then every week, this 2023 season, we just point to the flag and go trajectory of the team is how we'll judge this team. So if we win six games, my question is going to be, does, does Chris Ballard really come back on a six win, six win team? A five win team? Now maybe put maybe you're I think Vegas has them over at six and a half. Now go seven win team, right? But let's say it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough seven, right? And again, um we're gonna plug our own stuff here, right? Uh, I just went over the Colts 2023 opponents. There's some we haven't beat in a long time. And there's some, again, that we've beat maybe once in the past 10 years. Meaning, you know, I, I get it. It's a new day. It's a new team. It's a new generation. You got to look forward. Um, but the past isn't there for the fun of it. The past is there for a reason, right? And I think a lot of these teams are going to be playing this upcoming season. Mr. Ursay has a bad taste in his mouth with a lot of them as far as continuously seeing this team lose against them. And if we do that again, and it looks like the players out there just can't fulfill those big dollar contracts... Sometimes the rubber's going to have to meet the road, and sometimes the hot, the, the one's cold seat's going to turn hot. So as a Colts fan, obviously, we're staying optimistic. Uh, you know, we're looking to the light. We're trying to see the vision. But again, when, when it, you obviously got to keep your foot. You got to put your foot down when it's not. You got to make those expectations clear. Seems like that's been a problem with this Indianapolis Colts team the past couple of years, not having clear expectations. It's one thing you can talk about clear expectations. Yeah, yeah, we we, 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 we show the tape, the players are shaking their heads and nodding, and they look like they get it. Uh, but when they go out there on Sunday and they're not, you know, head shaking and nodding, we're crushing them out there. It, maybe it's not as crystal clear as you think. Maybe you got to point back to the number and go, you told me, you know, sign on the dotted line and no questions asked, right? Now I'm asking questions because the performance not means some of the contracts. Some of it could be coaching. We expect Shane Steichen to come in and clean some of that up. But this season, we're going to figure it out real quick. Is it players? Is it coaching? Who's, <laughs> who's it going to be? If it all excels, we're going to be high-fiving and smiling, and this channel is going to be going crazy. But again, my argument is clear expectations. We haven't had a whole lot of them. But it is a new day. I'll be optimistic. So until next time, thank you.